Um, yeah, again, today we will talk about blockchain and real estate. Um, we are live on YouTube as um, every time with our lecture series. Um, just some words about Hacker Dojo. It's a really great co-working space here. Um, and it's uh, open 24 seven. And yeah, the price or some tables, some spaces rented for, for a really good price. Um, the DEN, our community here is organizing um, yeah, the, the blockchain lecture series. Um, we have two main focuses. We are fo focusing on educating um, developers who want to become specialized blockchain developers and business, leader, business leaders who want to come up with new um, blockchain um, business ideas. We have also a new partnership with UCI and going to have some events with them uh, in cooperation. Some upcoming events are um, data structures and algorithms. Um, it's on April 6th. And um, yeah, some or two events in partnership with UCI. Um, I think it's the yeah, Ethereum um, developer course on May 6th and May 11th is blockchain for business leaders. And if you join our Telegram community today at t.me, uh, then Nexus, you will get 100 dollar off of any of our upcoming events. Just introduce yourself and say, uh, post maybe a picture that you were here at the event today. And then, um, yeah, we are happy to welcome you to our community and um, to upcoming events. Now I want to say a big thank you um, to our sponsors, the Tech Futures Group, and give over the word to Jerry. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you just for two minutes about Tech Futures Group. Some of you have heard this. Um, this is a picture of me. Uh, I never do this, but the photographer thought it captured the spirit. and I thought she was right, so I put that up. So you'll never see me do that. So what is Tech Futures Group? We're a nonprofit. We provide free business advice to tech companies uh, located in Northern California. Our services are free, we don't take equity, and we don't accept cash. We're funded by the Small Business Administration in the state of California. So everybody on our side gets paid, but all our services are free to you. Um, we're measured, our sponsors and our funders want us to deliver three things. The first is capital infusion, which is any money that goes uh, into your company or uh, that is not directly related to revenue. So in our world, it's mostly government grants and equity. We have done some loans or fund, uh, you know, f uh, debt, but we don't really focus on that. And then the other two measurements are jobs and revenue. I mean, I focus on capital infusion. The theory is if you raise a million dollars, you're likely to hire people, so jobs will go up. You're likely to get into market quickly, so revenue will go up. So we focus a lot on capital infusion. <coughs> We're not an accelerator. All right, so unlike an accelerator, we don't offer f us office space. We don't give you cash in, in, in return for equity. We don't have a programmatic element, lean startup or something like that. And we don't have a limited time period. So tech, I was one of the founders of Tech Future Group. We were founded in 2012. Um, I'm still, I was one of the original entrepreneurs in residence. You'll know what that is in a minute. But I'm still advising companies that joined Tech Futures Group uh, in about 2014. So it's you know, a long, long time, but so long as you're still making progress, we'll continue working with you. Um, <clears throat> we will accept people very, very early in the stage, so a researcher who's got an idea, maybe a technology partially developed, um, all the way to a company that's been around with revenue for 10 years or 20 years, okay? Our sweet spot is a small team a beta product or better, uh, some idea of the product market fit. You know, obviously if you have revenue, that's great, but it's not required. Pilot projects, that kind of thing is good too. Um, and what we help with is fundraising, uh, the capital infusion piece of it, uh, pretty much all the way up to C, up to uh, Series A. Uh, in, this, in this part, we're doing a lot of helping you negotiate with the Series A and l how to look at term sheets and that kind of thing. Um, our sweet spot, again, is sort of SBIR, government grants, and angel seed round. So that's where, where we do best. <clears throat> so the way it works is you apply to Tech Futures Group. 
Uh, I review it with Edgar, who's not here today, but some of you have been here uh, and the last ones have met him. Uh, if we like what we see, we send the application to one of our uh, lead advisors. We call them entrepreneurs in residence. They review the application, they talk to the, to, the, to the applicant, and they make a decision whether to accept or not. If they accept, they are your lead advisor, they provide strategic business advice, and bring in specialty advisors if you need them. So IP attorneys uh, who can help with you understanding the issues surrounding IP, copyrights, trademarks, that kind of thing. Uh, there's a manufacturing person. We've done a lot of medical. Um, and then there's the grant guys and a financial model advisor who will build a financial model for you so that you understand your business better and are better prepared uh, for pitches to VCs and angels. These are the you know, the advisory services that we offer, uh, you know, a lot of business strategy. We've helped companies pivot uh, and gone through that whole process uh, and been very successful. You know, IP, fundraising, manufacturing, private equity, and financing for those who are at that stage. Um, go to market, of course, uh, BD, financial modeling, and then the government grants. So you are in the center of our world uh, those are the EIRs. Uh, they have um, tremendous experience over a wide variety of industries and, and technologies. Um, they've all had a good exit or two. They provide strategic business advice. Uh, Pat Riley is the patent attorney. We have Gregory Thale, who works with a lot of bio, biotech companies, uh, manufacturing, uh, the financial model guys, and then the SBIR guys. Okay. Um, High potential clients are the ones who get the most of our time. So this is, uh, these are sort of words that we use, economic impact. So we look at jobs created, capital funding. So last year, our clients raised about 40 million. Um, it was about 37 clients raised that. Uh, we advise about 235 clients last year and then since the beginning of, of, our, uh, of our founding, it's about 195 million. 770 clients. That's it. Uh, I'll be here. So if you want to chat, uh, if, if there's a break, come see me during the break or come see me afterwards. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you so much. Um, now I want to welcome our speaker for today, Joe Albro. He's from the Real Estate Heroes. And um, yeah, in real estate, um, since you're lifelong, right? Fam started with family business, then became an investor, now you're a relator. Just, okay, all this way around. Um, yeah, and now you will talk a bit about blockchain use case in real estate. Thank you, appreciate it. Oh, okay. So I just want to tell you a little bit uh, about my background. So I'm a little different than most real estate agents. Most real estate agents uh, get a license, start selling real estate. I actually, grew up in a family that had apartments. So I grew up in the multifamily business. And I later on bought some of my own rentals. Uh, so I've owned rental properties. I've re uh, rehabbed properties. Uh, I've sold real estate. We do commercial, so uh, commercial leases. Uh, so it's a little bit, um, I think, of a different background than, than most agents. Uh, we started a brokerage uh, a couple years ago, Real Estate Heroes, uh, also doing business under the name REH Commercial. So when we talk about blockchain or cryptocurrencies in reference to real estate, most people get excited because they want to purchase a home with you know, some type of cryptocurrency. But we're uh, going to talk a little bit more about how blockchain can help in the actual transaction. Um, I or we in our industry, we've got some pain points that hopefully blockchain can help us out with. So uh, just to read off the slides first, uh, currently data is not accurate, no cross-check system against title companies, no good process tracking, lack of historically accurate information and paywalling of publicly available data. Let me kind of explain the process first and then I'll talk about these points. So I, I think a lot of people today want, uh, either want to buy a home or they, they hope to buy a home in the future. And it's a little bit of a confusing process. So typically you've got two agents. 
uh, a buyer's agent and a seller's agent, somebody who represents the seller and somebody who represents the buyer. So let's say I, we're representing you as a buyer. Uh, initially, we take you out, show you a few properties, and let's say that you get excited about a property and you want to make an offer. So we'll submit an offer to the other agent. Uh, now, the other agent may receive multiple offers on that property, and then from there, they'll select uh, one of the offers. But let's say we're the, we're the winning offer. We got selected. Okay, great. What happens then? Then we have to start working on what we call disclosures. And these are all the reports and warnings about what may be wrong with the property. Uh, lead paint advisories, uh, inspections, this type of thing. So this is where our first pain point starts to come in. Uh, we work a lot with email, and we work with other programs like DocuSign or ZipLogic. So some of these documents need to be signed by the brokerage, the agent, uh, the buyers, the sellers, and also the selling agent. Well, the way this works is on my end, I send it out to you guys on, let's say, ZipLogic. So let's say I've got to sign it, a husband's got to sign it, and a wife's got to sign it. It goes first to one person, and until they sign it, it doesn't move on to the next person. So once they do that, I then email it over to the other side and then they have to import it into their zip logic and do the same thing on the other side. Well, the problem is that we're sending all these documents around uh, via email and it's a very inefficient process. If these documents could be held, let's say, on a chain, where now we can just access these documents, all of us can just access them without having to go from one to another to another, but we could just access them all at the same time, it makes this process a lot easier and there's no loss of documents. We end up with physically printed documents, we end up with documents that are in zip logic, we end up with documents that are in email. So we end up with documents in a variety of different locations and at some point we either have to print all these things or we've got to scan some of the other documents to put them all into one system. Again, if they were already on the chain, there's nothing to print, there's nothing to scan, there's nothing to move, it's already there. So that's our, our first biggest pain point, uh, and that saves us a lot of time. Um, Daniel has a buddy who, who told him that uh, Mondays are their paperwork day. They do nothing on Monday, but just do the paperwork for a transaction. That's how much paperwork is involved in the, uh, some of these transactions. So that's our first pain point. Then once we get all of this paperwork wrapped up, we now have to send it over to title in escrow. So title basically takes your money and, uh, I'm sorry, escrow basically takes your money, holds it, and then if the transaction's fine, they'll disperse the funds to the appropriate um, parties, usually the buyer. If there's uh, a loan on the property, they'll go ahead and pay off the loan and then they'll disperse the rest of the funds to the uh, seller. So that's another thing that eventually blockchain may be able to handle. Uh, we may no longer need escrow companies or, or a more limited type of escrow company because if the funds are in, uh, on the chain and if the transaction is approved, well then the chain itself could disperse the funds to whatever parties it needs to go to. Uh, from there, we, uh, Title sends it over to, uh, I'm sorry, Title records the sale. So what Title does is Title searches to make sure that there are no other claims on that property, that no one else owns that property. Uh, and there are times that they do the research, they don't find anything, and later on there are claims on that property. So that's why we pay for Title insurance. And Title insurance is basically our insurance that if anything else comes up later, that uh, title will cover it. Well, again, if these recording of title was done, was done on the chain, it would be a lot faster. Uh, it would be easier for uh, title to research the title to make sure that the title is clean. And also, it, it, it would just be a, a much simpler process on our, on our end. So currently data is not accurate. There, there are multiple times, again, like I said, that we later find out that there were liens on that home. Uh, a lien is basically 
they owed somebody money uh, and they weren't, uh, the title search didn't pull up those liens. No cross check against uh, title companies. There have been instances where, and it's a scam, where somebody has tried to sell the same home to do different people. And they were trying to close on the same day so that when these title companies went to record, they had already gotten the money from both sides. So uh, that doesn't happen often, but it has happened. Uh, no good process tracking. Well, this gets very confusing for the buyer and seller because there's a lot of documents moving back and forth, but the system doesn't really tell them the steps. Look, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that, and then we'll be done. It's basically us having to, to advise them at every step what's coming next. If the system could kind of break it down and show them where they were in this process, it wouldn't be much easier. Uh, Lack of historically accurate information, again, title sometimes uh, misses things. Paywalling of publicly available data. Uh, sometimes when we pull up public data uh, on a property, we're having to pay for it where it really is public data, but there are some companies out there that want to charge for that data. Uh, one of the things that we have to pull up is we have to see, it, it, uh, in some counties they require certain things like Oakland, they require a sewer lateral, which means that we've got to do a sewer inspection uh, to make sure that the sewer is fine. If not, that, the seller has to fix that before it's sold. Well, that's something specific to Oakland. So those type of details we need to be able to look up per county. Um, so that's, that's a little bit about the process and a little bit about some of the pain points that we experience. Okay. so. We've talked about a little bit about this, but what would blockchain solve for us? A uh, recording of tie, a title would be more accurate and uh, via verified methods. Uh, quicker search of title. Process status checks. What step is the process at? And clear record keeping. And it's immutable data. So that is the biggest benefit of blockchain, that the data is immutable that we can take these contracts, put them on the line, know that they're not gonna be tampered with, uh, know that we're not gonna have somebody later on claiming that they've got an amendment or some other piece of the contract that wasn't included, and this saves us a lot of headache in lawsuits because at the end of the day, there are a lot of lawsuits that happen over real estate. It gets very costly. It's very long, and uh, at the end of the day, it could have been avoided had we had a better system, uh, like having the documents on the chain. So I know we've got a couple of slides of the technical uh, aspects of this, but I'll read the slides and later on refer to Daniel for the uh, technical aspects of this. Uh, advantages of using open source software in real estate. Most software is proprietary and carries hefty expenses. Systems have little to no interoperability. Uh, lack of bug and vulnerability disclosures from software providers. Integrations are not possible. Lack of expansion in the space by non-corporate entities. So uh, the systems we use today aren't very great. Everybody's heard of the MLS. Well, the MLS isn't one big system. The MLS is a group of separate systems and they're specific to an area. And that area usually has something that we call a board. Um, I hate to say it, I'm part of the, well, I shouldn't say that. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. um, you've got Realtor.com, you've got Redfin, and you've got Zillow. Most people end up using Redfin, even though Realtor.com owns all of the MLSs, but, Redfin works a little better uh, for most people. I'm not saying for me, I'm saying for most people. Uh, so it's, we've got all of these systems that we're trying to combine to make it work as one, and it, it doesn't always work well. For me to look at property in a different board or a different area, I have to become part of that board. I can't just look it up. Uh, so. This was an old way of working where there were actually physical books for a certain area. And as time went on, those books got 
put on the line and they're still working in that system, but that whole process needs to be revamped. And hopefully with a better system, we could revamp some of those processes. So, so not all chains are created equal. Uh, the chain, and Daniel can speak more about this uh, and more about Burst, but using a centralized chain would imply controlling entity Transaction speeds are Ill irrelevant when using Ledger for data storage. Sub-minute speeds are not needed. TCO, total cost of ownership of imp implementation is critical for any companies or agencies interested in the space. And open source licensing blockchain software allows for integration using cross-chain solutions when conditions require it. I'll let Daniel talk about the technical aspects. I know I kind of blew through this very quickly and uh, I apologize if I did. Uh, does anybody have any questions on anything I've said so far? Does anybody have any questions on the process of real estate? And I should have turned that off, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, that is a problem because you've got all of these different boards with their proprietary, some with their proprietary systems. Some boards will use the same system as a different board, but no. And it would have been best had there been one agency that had a controlling board or one single board um, or one single software that all these boards tied into. So the answer is no. And so far, I'm specifically talking about residential. We've got this whole other side called commercial where you've got a couple of good providers which are LoopNet and CoStar, but they're extremely expensive. And um, actually commercial has a far bigger need uh, for some of these systems, I think, than even residential. Uh, any other questions? Did that answer your question or? Okay. We are, uh, yeah, uh, so we, we've been analyzing and looking at what we feel uh, on the residential side would help with the transaction. Um, we're gonna be doing some things on the commercial side also. Um, I don't know if I can give out those details yet. Okay, um, I mean, we're putting together a system to basically facilitate the, the transaction, kill some of these pain points. Uh, an example would be, we've got a brokerage, I bring on a new agent, okay? Uh, there's a mountain of disclosures, a mountain of different paperwork. They're confused. They have no idea what they should use for this transaction because if I'm selling you a condo, that's very different than send it, selling you a fourplex uh, or a rental unit. So. It's a very simple thing, doesn't seem very difficult, but just a, a wizard where you can plug in what type of transaction you're doing. Is it a single family residence? Is it in a trust? Is it in probate? And when you put in all the parameters, it'll tell you what forms you should use. Now, forms aren't standard either. Here in Northern California, we use car forms, but in other places, they use different forms. And for commercial, they use different forms. So typically when you're in the same area, you're using the same form, uh, at least on the residential side. Again, on commercial, there's no standardization on, on purchase contracts. Uh, a lot of times they're proprietary. But on the residential side, to answer your question, um, the system would help the agent walk through it it would speed up the process. It's a very lengthy process. If, if you don't know, if you've never purchased a home, it could typically take 30 days. Uh, a lot of the time is because of the lender and, and getting the funding, but it is a very long process. Did, did that answer your question or? Okay, uh, any other questions or? Sorry guys, it's a boring topic, I, I apologize. Um, Danny, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the technical stuff, or? Yeah, so, uh, oh, okay, go ahead. That—that's the—that's the easy one, I think, to identify, right? 
Oh, what's the what? Well, uh, the title is one of the career comp components. The other thing is, okay, how about identifying who's signing the documents? So I send you a DocuSign. Well, how'd you sign up on DocuSign? You went on DocuSign, you put in your email, and you said you were you. So uh, if there was a little more process of identification, right, uh, I think that'd be critical also. Um, in commercial, there are quite a few pain points. Uh, but you're right, in residential, I think title would be the biggest one. I'm sorry. Uh, Correct. So what? Okay. So as far as the ownership of the data, will the the boards are currently, like you said, selling their data to Zillow and Redfin. So. Correct. 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 When you're talking about agents that are realtors, but when you're talking about agents who are on Redfin, they're, they're on Redfin, so Redfin owns that data. Okay. Correct. I'm just differentiating. They do. Correct. So... Exactly. So this is what I was talking about, that there's different MLS boards, and Zillow and Redfin are buying this data from all of these boards from the MLS, and they're different MLSs. Are you also an agent? Or? Okay, so, so you know that if you want to sell a home in L.A., you've got to get on their board. It's a completely different board. So, as far as solving that, he was correct. If there was a way of, uh, of having one system, as opposed to multiple systems that would solve it, you know the boards aren't going to give up ownership of their data. So, the best we can do is to create a system and get them to use that system. That is the only solution I see that could solve this issue, because as long as there's multiple boards, it's going to be a, a, an issue. Uh, because you're, you're trying to get these different pieces of software to connect, and a lot of times the, the structure of data is very different, you know, from board to board. Um, you and you know that the, uh, there have been attempts by different software companies to combine this data, and it hasn't worked. Is it because, again, the data is being stored differently. Um, so it just, it just doesn't work. And I don't think they're going to get it to work well, do you? No, I, I don't think so either. So the only way or the only solution I see, create a, a good program that they can then onboard onto, migrate onto. And if they could slowly all migrate onto it, then now we've got a, a consistent system uh, that would work differently than the way they're working now. Uh, I should be able, or you should be able to search properties on a different MLS, right? Uh, we can search properties on Redfin, we can search properties on Realtor.com, but I can't go into my MLS and search a property. I'm paying $1,700 every year just for my ability to access. Uh, it's quite a bit of money, and honestly, uh, you know, if we're going to pay that much in tools, the tools should be better, right? So, uh, as far as ownership of the data, 
they can own the data. That's fine as long as it's on the system, as long as everybody's working on the same system. The transaction we talked about, and then Tato we also talked about. So it would be nice if we can get them all onto one system, um, and hopefully they're watching this video. Uh, it would be great. Uh, did I answer your question or not, really? Yeah. That's a good question. And th that's, I think, a little more of a, a technical question. But currently, title, you know, title has to send it over. If it could just be sent over electronically, and again, if, it was ver if everybody was verified, if the identity of everybody was verified and it could just be sent as, as soon as we completed transaction, they could just simply accept it, review it, and they, they could receive it on their end, and then either accept the transaction or not. So I, I, as far as the technical end with the county, they would have to have some access to the system also. Or they would have to have a system that would be able to accept that data. What's that? Correct. Co correct, yes. Any other questions? So, um, I guess you meant, I would talk about the wrong race. Mm -hmm. That's what she was talking about, also. Correct. So that that's the elimination of escrow is what you're saying. I think it's going to get more complicated than that. So I think that you're going to have people that already own pieces of property and they're going to want to tokenize those pieces of property. So they're going to want to sell off bits of their equity to other people. So now you're going to have multiple entities on title. So title is going to get. On the blockchain. I, I, I do. I think you're asking me. How can we get everybody onto the blockchain, and when does that happen, in essence? In other words, when can we quit relying on the old form of doing title? Correct. So, well, so if we start to implement blockchain, as these sales occur, if the title's clean, right, if, if they've done the search and there's no liens, there's nothing on that title, there's no disputes, if the title is clean when it goes onto the blockchain, well, then that should be truth at that point for that specific property. The question is, how do you deal with properties when there is no sale? And that may be, uh, that may be an issue where we, the county, I guess, would have to 
property by property, do that research, clean, make sure that title's clean, and themselves move that, that uh, property onto the blockchain. No, no, I'm just saying, I'm, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying there had to be a purchase. I'm just saying that whatever government agency is, it goes in, they, they check, they do research. If it's clean, they're, they're just putting it on the chain. Yeah, because how, you, you can put everything on the chain, but what you're asking me is how do we know what we're putting on the chain is correct and that there won't be any disputes, correct? Nothing in the past, nothing to come haunt us, basically. Well, it's, it, it, it's going to be a benefit as we move into the future because it's going to, A, make title searches faster, uh, and B, it, they should be accurate because at that point you've cleaned the titles or you've done the research and these titles should be clean. I mean, yeah. Correct, and that's a good question. So we can start a blockchain, we can start a new program, that's correct. Is the government uh, or the agency gonna respect that blockchain or accept it or use it? Probably not, they'll probably create their own so that, again, there will be multiple copy, copies, there will be one in our blockchain and there will be one in their blockchain. Hopefully it'll reference ours, um, but, Unfortunately, there there probably still will be multiple blockchains. I don't I, I don't see a way around that. Well, there there have been purchases of properties with Bitcoin, so these transactions have happened. That's that's pretty much as far as we've gotten. Uh, who are the players? There there's a bunch of small players uh, in the industry right now. Um, have I seen anything significant? I, I, not really, not yet, other than some purchases. Um, that, that's about it. So there, there's still a lot to be developed in this space. And it's such a huge space that you're going to have multiple things being developed in this arena. Again, I didn't turn that off. You think I would have learned from the first time. Well, the bigger question is, do we even have control over that, right? So I think they're going to set that up the way they want to set that up, and, and I don't think the counties are going to want to give up control of that. Um, so I don't think we're going to have much of a choice in that. Um, the local um, cities or, or counties are going to want to keep control, and typically you're still going to have people who are going to walk into the office. Even though we're doing it on the chain, they may still have people walking in, and somebody's going to have to take that transaction and put it on the chain. I know it doesn't matter if you're in Alameda County, you can put something on the chain in, in a different county. I, I understand that, but I, I just don't think they're going to want to give up control of that. Is that fair? Okay. So today we're just talking about it. Are we working on something? Yeah, we've started working on something, but um, I'll let Daniel talk about what we're working on and, and how much of it we can talk about.
So building up a smart contract or what? Okay, so um, we'd be we'd be working on the entire transaction, um, including the, the people, all of the parties who would be involved in the transaction. We're currently starting on the residential side, but we'll be moving on to the commercial side also. I think a lot of people don't really understand the benefit. Um, I, I think a lot of people just don't understand blockchain to begin with. And uh, it's one of those scenarios where you kind of have to build it, and as they use it, they'll start to see the benefit of it. Um, but if we're going to try and get their approval before we build something, you won't go anywhere. Yeah. Pretty much, or and in this case, it's something that they have to physically see and use before they they can understand it. Uh, I mean, again, you're in the real estate industry. Am I wrong on this? Yeah, yeah. No, uh, we're not, and we're, we're basically taking into consideration the processes we use here. I'm not familiar with how they transact their transactions. So we're building, our, uh, the project we're working on is taking into consideration how we actually transact business here. So remember, when there's a mistake on title, title's got to cover that. They're selling you an insurance. Sure, sure. I'm selling you an insurance policy, but like any insurance policy, they don't actually want to pay out, right? They don't want any mistakes. Correct. If, if we start from kind of the beginning of the transaction, and, and start building a system to work with all the people who are involved in the transaction, agents, escrow, title company, purchaser, seller, uh, lenders. Um, there's, there's a variety of people who come into play. Once they see the benefit, then the, the counties or the cities or the state would see the benefit. Uh, so in your two approaches, our approach would be to work with the players first and then assume that the counties would see the benefit and start to, to integrate it. How much time do you spend on, on putting together a transaction? Okay, but disclosures, everything else. How, how, people in your office, how often, how long do they take? Okay, that's my ally. If I build a good system and she likes it, that's my ally, right? If I make. Correct. 
Uh, yeah, exactly. But to answer his question, he's saying, who's our allies? If I build a system that makes your life easier, you're going to promote the system, and, and you're going to, get to want other people to use the system. You get enough momentum, you get enough people on the system, other people start to integrate into it. Okay, but what we're doing, I think, benefits the title companies. So, it, you know, a title company is a company. So, if we can speed up your searches, uh, if we can cut down your errors, if you're paying out less on title insurance, why are you arguing with us? Why would you fight us? I, I don't. I don't. I, I think we're helping them. Is that make, is that fair? Okay. I think initially what we are are better tools for people like her um, because we can produce better tools than our current MLS. We can speed up the transaction and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but to us, Zillow and, and Redfin really are competitors, right? So uh, if we can build it, oh, I'm sorry. Sure, but his question is, are we attempting to replace a Zillow? As, uh, so her as an agent, she works with the MLS. Zillow is, is a thing that she looks at, but it's not really her tool. So we're not really looking to replace Red and Finn and Zillow. We're looking to build better tools. And in the process, we'll probably start to push out or hopefully become more effective than, than some of these other competitors. Yeah, we do, badly. Sure. So most things, Zillow and Redfin, they're in, a, in essence trying to cut out the agent, correct? So again, as far as acceptability, we're not trying to cut people out. We're giving them better tools. If I can speed it up for the lender, if I can speed it up for the title company, if I can save the title company money in payouts, if I can make their processes or their businesses more effective, I, I don't see an issue with acceptability because we're not competing with them. It, w it will still take some time um, because it's a huge industry and there's a lot of people in this industry. And uh, I mean, let's be a little realistic. We're in, Silicon Valley, we adopt things a lot faster than everybody else, right? Um, so, like anything, it'll get adopted in an area first, or in multiple areas, and then those areas will hopefully expand, and there will be further adoption. Does that answer? Okay. Any other questions? Oh, you moved. 
For, for maybe the paperwork, yeah, you're right, but uh, have you ever had some for sale by owners and then they get frustrated and they, they contact you? A, a lot of people... You know, the, the, but some of them won't need us, but the problem with sellers, typically, and buyers, is the, the thing that's not on the blockchain, which is the emotional component. Some sellers just, you know, they don't want to s sell and, and they want you to, to comply to everything they want. Well, there has to be that intermediary that's going to have to work with them and explain uh, to them, hey, you know, look, this is the market. It's, I, I know you think your house is made of gold, and everybody does. Uh, I, I know that you, you did repairs on your home and you, you probably think you've added this amount of value to your home, but really you didn't. There, there has to be that party in the middle that can make the transaction happen. Uh, it's not just information being exchanged. There's actually a negotiation aspect to this, right? Again, it's the, let's take a, a, a different area, uh, divorce court, right? People know what their assets are. They could easily and logically cut them down the middle, but yet they drag it out in court for months or even years, right? Why? Because of all of that uh, emotional aspect. Um, and that's the one thing that I, I don't think blockchain could do is the, the negotiating point of it. Uh, and there are homes, you know, for some homes, yeah, maybe you can because they're standard neighborhoods. It's pretty cookie cutter. Again, we're talking about residential. What about commercial? You know, commercial is not so cookie cutter. And there, there are residential neighborhoods that aren't so cookie cutter. And they're a little, especially in commercial, there's a lot of things that get negotiated. And, you know, there, there are investors. Um, and other types of parties that, you know, they, they kind of specialize in these, these weird deals. You know, when the market's good, deals are pretty standard. When the market's bad, deals start getting very creative, right? So. Oh. Yes, there is. That's right. Yes. 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 So, so it sounds like you're familiar with commercial real estate. Okay. Sure, and now opportunity zones are also coming into play, and opportunity zones are now coming into play also. Uh, so for you, like you said, your contract isn't going to be this cookie cutter standard purchase contract. Uh, it's going to be a lot more complex.
That's a good question. Uh, so we, as agents, pay I uh, $1,700 a year just to have access to the MLS. Uh, I don't know how much you pay. So with this, we can create different types of payment plans. Uh, there, there are agents that don't conduct very many transactions. And if there was a pay-per-use type of scenario to where they were paying only when they were actually conducting business, a lot of times we, the agents, uh, because we're paying for the MLS, we're, we're really the ones paying for these systems, I think. So I don't think that would change. We could just come up with different payment options. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> and we may have, I don't know. I, I don't know how to answer that yet, so, but it's a good question. Yeah. Any other questions? Daniel, do you want to talk a little bit about the technical end? Because uh, I. So I'm working with Joe and his team on developing a real estate project that essentially streamlines the process while using a blockchain. Blockchain we're using is Burstcoin and the other aspects of the chains that we're doing are cross-chain compatibility. The reason for that is that there are some entities that are already out there that are doing some management with data on their chain. Well, this is all software, so let's not pretend that it's like metric versus US system. We can literally just write APIs and, and build systems that work cross together, just like the databases for the MLS and various other things. Uh, this is also where, uh, as mentioned earlier in one of his slides, the paywalling of public data. So this is one of the problems that you have, uh, especially here in Silicon Valley, which you may or may not know unless you actually are a part of the realtor uh, industry, is that you can't actually go and get data for even here that's accurate or correct um, because a lot of times someone else owns the data that they're going to sell to you that they actually just copied from the county and are just pre presenting it to you in JSON format, by the way, versus whatever format the county is given in which case. I don't even want to talk about Santa Clara County right now, but in case someone's watching, they'll get very upset with what I have to say about them. Um, basically, what happened was is that there's a, all this data that you can't get. Well, counties do a really good job of providing it. However, it's not well documented, right? So part of the system was to get that data and then associate it with how you want to inject titles or insert titles into the blockchain which would lead to clear titles and surveying and things like that. So as I mentioned earlier, if you wanted to buy this property, you're gonna have to have, you know, you're gonna have to have a surveyor out here anyway. They're gonna have to do a bunch of these things. At that moment, when you start putting clean data into a, a data source, right? This is, this is how an MLS starts, this is how everything starts. If you don't start doing it, then guess what? It stays the same. I don't know if you guys know that or not, but it's, it's a hard thing to, to stomach. But with that data and being able to track per transaction, you can have amendments, you can have these steps that are done. Along with that is getting rid of the idea of having to rely on a software third party, such as uh, DocuSign, ZipLogic. Uh, the state of Washington has approved GPG to be a legal form of notary and a legal form of identification. So because public and private key pairs are kind of what blockchains do, uh, one could cryptographically sign a transaction stating that they are this person and inserting their title or their deed onto a chain if they choose to sell it and go through these processes. The problem is, is that most people get really scared when they start hearing these things and they're like, that's really complicated. And then when you start taking a look at what APIs do, they do a lot of amazing things that simplify this for you. Uh, most of what we described, even if you don't work as a software developer, you could spend a weekend to really get a grasp of how to interact with a chain if you stop thinking of the intimidation factor of what it is, right? It's just a data store. Whether that data is a transaction for buying a loaf of bread or if that transaction literally contains a PDF file. It doesn't care. It's all the same. It was paid for. It was mined. It is stored and it is on the nodes and it's accessible. 
So if we understand those ideas, then all of a sudden all these complexities around the idea of using a blockchain for such a transaction or a streamline of a process becomes much easier. And if you are a software engineer, I will 100% guarantee you, you do much more complicated things anytime you use anything like Google, Firebase, Crashlytics, any of that. You do far more complex things on your day to day than any of this stuff actually is. And the reason why, blockchains are really simple. They're not parallel, they're, they're, they're FIFO. First in, first out, that's, that's what they do. They're, they're not meant to be complex things as procedurally they can't be. Um, and the reason they can't be is because once you start paralleling and doing all this other interesting, wonderful threading things, guess what happens? Collisions, issues, uh, hash functions start breaking, cryptographic functions are broken, things like that. So that was a quick crash course as to what we're working on. So far the back end is done. We are looking for another JavaScript person to come make a pretty UI, so I need one more. If you're interested, please get in touch with me. Well, well, yeah, so actually the back end's already done for a, a, a test area that we're doing. We just have to build an, like a front end. That's why I was asking for a JavaScript dev, because I have someone that's doing the design. I need someone to actually do JavaScript. I don't write JavaScript. No, we're actually doing API integration and hash mapping, and we're able to store a lot of this on chain and being able to utilize transactions to actually store data and to be able to retrieve that data by using service such as Cloudburst, which allows you to do that, which you can take to another chain. However, you start then having to worry about cost, execution cost, timing, how bloated the chain's gonna be. You have, a, you have a bunch of other factors that start going into there at scale. So old data can be imported. The thing is about old data is you need to get it verified, right? So how you would do that is you could use GPG to cryptographically sign that the data is valid from both the county and holders of the, uh, the title. They could actually approve of that and then insert. You have three signatures. I mean, that's the same as me signing something now. You have me, the buyer, seller, and a witness, or me, the witness, and a notary, you know, or whatever. I mean, you have those options now. So what we've pulled right now for data outside of what the MLS has is what you would normally pay for, like crime statistics, things like that. That data is not stored on chain. That data is stored in a reference hash to the title, which is actually stored on chain. And the reason why is because that data will change about crime statistics, what's going on in tax rates. That, that stuff changes constantly. There's no reason to keep that on the chain. I only need to keep who actually owns by who inserted that title into the chain. Correct. Correct. So a lot of this data, what I found, and I didn't know this until like late last year when we started working on this, is that a lot of that data is paywalled. And it's actually weird that it's paywalled because all of it's public data. They just don't tell you how to get to it. So <laughs> spending, uh, spending time to, to research to how to get to that point is, is how this project really got going. Because at first, that was the complexity part, was to figure out what type of you know, restrictions were on the property, whether like you mentioned earlier, sewer, or whether or not you gotta worry about the trees, uh, you know, uh, was it endangered birds? That's another one I didn't realize was a thing, but there's actually a, a whole claim about endangered bird flight paths. If they come near your property in some parts of California, you actually have a special little tag on your property about that. And, all these other things. But see, that's data that to the individual they don't know about. But to, to even some brokers they don't know about, and the agents at, at all. So if you can't put this in an easily searchable way that can be associated to the title itself, how are we gonna guarantee the data was ever accurate to begin with? Right, and that's always been the problem because county will tell you something different than a title company. I saw that firsthand. <laughs> so, is there any other questions? Very good question. So uh, that's what we're, we're hoping for, is to be able to form organizations on our platform, whether it be a brokerage, maybe a board, maybe a, a larger organization. 
you're not gonna cut out the you, you're not gonna cut out. <laughs> uh? Well, uh, I mean, you still uh, boards still do trainings. They still do quite a few things, right? So, it, it, the option could be there. Let's just say, okay. Um, so to answer your question, yes, put brokerages on there and other organizations. And remember, in real estate, you, you've got other parties that are involved also. You've got appraisers, title companies, escrow companies, you know, home inspections, a variety of people who may need access or some type of interface to, to upload information also. Yes. Oh, baby, no. Yes, no. <laughs> okay. so, so just so you know, the platform. Uh, so the reason the platform is interesting is because it's open source. And so for, say, for example, not here in California, let's say Nebraska, Omaha, right? Someone wants to add Omaha, Nebraska. Well, instead of having to write their own everything, we're going to provide an implementation library and how to do that for your own area. Basically, every county, according to some federal laws, are supposed to provide API data. Now, of course, this may go by rural counties. That may be harder to get. However, to start somewhere, every county or every city that has it available, if someone in that city or town is a realtor, right, they can literally find someone who will actually do the implementation. They can follow our how-to, and the integration's pretty, pretty cut and paste. You literally will just provide your public API key that your county issued to you and the URL, and that's kind of it. And you'll basically start to build that data and you'll be able to query that data against titles that you will then start to put there. And you associate that with the address. Keep in mind that literally, this is just like any other insert into a regular database, right? You're literally just mapping, here's a correlate or collate from here to here. This, this is all I'm doing. And, and that's what we're trying to break down the understanding is that just because it's on chain doesn't mean that every piece of data is on chain. The only piece that needs to be on chain immutably, clearly, is actually the title. And so for integrations for the data sets and things like that, we've allowed the API to be very easily to be implemented for other areas. And that was the point of growth is so that there's no company or entity locking out someone from being able to use it. Because that's what happens right now. So like if you want to start your own MLS or you want to start your own data storage for this stuff, someone's going to say, no, you can't just do that. Well, why can't I? It's public data, right? So give the power to the people with the open source to allow them to create, add, implement, and to extend it. This also builds an ecosystem and it also allows for better implementation of features going forward. And with that, it also maybe will breed a new light into the idea of revamping how real estate is done. And you know, that, that was always my goal. So, I'm, so what is done right now is that you can take publicly available data in three counties in this area and pull them associated to an address. With that, you will also be able to distinguish if, if it was in our title set. So I only have about 50 titles that are in there right now. And basically, if it's associated to that, you can get all the data and find out what the status of the title is based on last known cell and the accuracy of that data because they're new properties. And that's why we use those as the original test cases. So this is new data right now as far as importing uh, historical. Problem is, is finding the right people who can actually verify that that data was right to begin with. Yeah, Sweet Spot is gonna be closing. But yeah, I mean, as far as... <laughs> But again, like, like I said, the, the back end's done. We, we need help with, with making it look pretty. But as far as being able to associate the data, it was literally just taking things that should have been interoperable to begin with. And, and instead of making a proprietary system where one entity can control who gets it, why not follow the open standard, which was allow everyone to be able to input into it to make it better? Right. 
So, so that part, that part hasn't been fully done. The only part we're at to right now is verifiable title is clean state. This is the associated data associated to that title. And that means like crime statistics, everything like that, easily mapped and trust, non-trust, that kind of basic stuff. That came from hours and hours of, of hacking around and working with Joe and his team, uh, as well as doing a bunch of exploration and messing around with the county records. Uh, which, by the way, they don't use JSON, and I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, it's, it's, it's clean canvas right now. Literally, the back end is completely written in Rust. All the APIs are ready to go there. Uh, the only thing that would probably be best to use is if someone would maybe wants to experiment with WebAssembly. That might be an interesting approach to take with it. Uh, I'd be interested to explore changing it to that. But yeah, the back end's written in Rust. And there's a, actually, I, I like, there's most of it's in Rust, part of it's in C. So, and that was just because C made more sense at the time when I started on that piece. Oh, for using Burst to do a transaction for a normal one megabyte file, most titles are like, what was it, 75 kilobytes? Whenever you strip out all the garbage watermarking that uh, what was it uh, Zip Logic and everyone else puts in, when you put when you strip that out, each title is only about 75 kilobytes. That roughly translates into uh, three tenths of a cent, something like that. Yeah. So for the TCO part of that, it made more sense for long term. But using the messages protocol, which will be the next step, will allow for printable data so that the blockchain itself doesn't explode. And that will allow the user, if you run a node and you don't want anything to do with that stuff, you can actually just prune the data off of there. Keep in mind, uh, Burst has both a regular transaction model and a messages, and you can utilize both for that. But one's printable, the other one is not. So. No. <laughs> no not a, it's not Burst coin. <laughs> no, it will not be on Ethereum at all. Ethereum for for making transactions like this for the storage, the price consensus, like the price alone, if you look at just injecting that data, is going to roughly cost you about $8 per right now. So why pay $8 when you pay three tenths of a cent? Just, just pure business at this point if you want to look at it from TCO. The other point is that you can mine this with a hard drive, and if you're only using, say, I don't know, three, uh, was it four tenths of a burst or five tenths or even half a burst? For this types of transaction that's cheaper, you can actually mine it yourself. You can create a sustainable business model just by doing that. So there, there are plenty of different avenues that were taken for that, but also uh, you need easy API, and you need anyone that wants to run the node to not have to pull down a terabyte of data, because otherwise without a full node, you can't actually start facilitating the transactions you need to actually talk to the chain. No, no, no. <laughs> OK. Sorry. Uh, Anyone else have a technical question? Go ahead. So whenever you're doing an SLA array, so it depends. If the data is going to be stored on chain, your SLA is going to be whatever your response time is going to be from your API or whatever, where you're requesting the API to the node. So because it's already stored on the node, the node already has all the data in the chain. The chain's there. It just pulls the data. So from there, your response time, I don't know, 50, 60 milliseconds, something like that. I think the longest that we saw right now the other day was when we pulled three at one time. It was like a minute, but that was because I was also doing something stupid on my device. So that's not really accurate. But I mean, I'm being honest, like, like yeah. <laughs> so, that is not my job to figure out. I am just writing software. I, thought, uh, I, I just write software and I write open source software. That's, someone else can figure out how to monetize it. I'm literally building the framework for such a tool that would be usable because real estate currently is all proprietary. There's very little open source. And by bringing in open source and presenting a way of having an easily integratable solution that's distributed, That, that's all I have. Like, like, that's all the business we're, we're still talking about these contests, but I, I, I still see a benefit in, in the boards, but that, that's a whole different conversation, yeah. Yeah. Currently, we're, we're just working on, on putting together the open source component. Uh, any other questions for me or for Daniel? Okay, I guess we're done because she's standing up. <laughs> <laughs>
I mean, that was a hit, right? <laughs> Time's over. <laughs> uh, Oh, why do I think it? it? Because we work with these tools every day, and honestly, they could be better. Uh, I mean, right? Aren't, how, how many? Yeah, I mean, I mean, we're frustrated. So we're the pain point. So uh, it's a, you build a better mousetrap, and people will use it. So About what? Profit. Oh, I, I'm not familiar with him, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry. Um, I, yeah, any other questions? If not, we'll wrap it up. I mean, I already got my sign here. That. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, thank you for coming out tonight, and I uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, um, everyone, for coming um, to our 10th lecture or blockchain lecture series. You can say a bit network, but it would be nice if you help us to put the shares together. Thank you. <laughs>